Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today's show, we have lighting designer Edward Bartholomew for part two. Now we're actually going to talk about lighting, which should be super fun. But before we get into that, we got to go to the craziest people in lighting. That's right. TCPI.com. Greg, TCP, what do you got to say about them, sucker? Well, they have this new Solistic product that is the most natural sun-like light bulb on the market. It has advanced LED chip that mimics natural sunlight, reduces blue light exposure, high CRI of 97. I know CRI is not the only thing we got to evaluate now, but it has a high R9 value as well. It comes in a floor lamp, a table lamp, a T8 tube, and what they call their little starlight, which is like a screw and flood type. Nice product. We've actually sold quite a bit of it because it's the highest CRI LED tube that I know about. You know, CRI still matters. Although not to m- amongst those in the lighting industry that are into, you know, this TM30 or whatever it is. But for the general public and the average li- guy in the lighting order desk, he's looking at CRI. Customers that call in, they're looking for that CRI number. So go to tcpi.com. That's right. And the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, TCP longtime member, proud member. And check it out, guys. You want some training? You know where to, you know where to find nailed. NAILD.org. But for right now... Edward Bartholomew on Get a Grip on Lighting. Hey, guys. What's happening, Edward? It's all good. It's been a beautiful weekend and uh, ready to get going on this week. Sure. Yeah. Time to get after it. Well, we need to, you know, last time we had, we had a hot topic we got on due, but this time we want to talk lighting, as Mike said. So let's, let's <laughs> we get solved the, the last, on you. <laughs> we solved the last topic, which was really good. We're done. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, you know, this, I, this I would, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't say that. I would just say that the that what what would happen was that communication lines were open, and that's always a great right. start. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that people, you know, are, are you know know what you know where they can come when they need uh, a platform or somewhere to speak, mm-hmm. and they want to ha- they want to bring an issue to the table. I think that's a big victory for the lighting industry, and um, yeah. I think communication is a, is a good beginning, and uh, there's a lot more efforts happening um, in the background. And uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, absolutely, having a, a forum like such as yours is in, very important to put those issues out, and, uh, and we'll keep putting them out. Yeah, and, the, and we we spoke to, and if you have, if you're listening to this and you don't know what we're talking about, um, Edward and Greg and I had a conversation a couple weeks ago that you should might want to listen to first. Um, go back, it's in the Get a Grip Online website or iTunes or whatever, and check it out. But yeah, you know, the, the Nailed Board um, discussed what we talked about, and I know there's been some conversations in the background that, you know, are, are you know private and confidential. But of course, you know, th- we're here to help, and Greg's here to help. And so, yeah, I think, I think we accomplished a lot. You know, never underestimate, everyone underestimates the short-term impacts of things, or overestimates the short, or over-wants the short-term without... And then underestimates the long term. Yeah, you got to play the long game yeah. in this, and and that's very important. And uh, yeah. and so that's one of the things that I'm you know committed to in my firm as well. So absolutely. So playing the long game. How long you been in lighting? Thirty years. I graduated that's from Parsons. School, yeah, Parsons School of Design uh, back in the '90s, and I've uh, been doing it ever since. And uh, you know, as you know, this industry has changed a lot, so I've had to unlearn a lot of things <laughs> I learned back then, as we all have. Mm-hmm. What's the number one thing so, you had to unlearn? Ballast factor. Things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Gone. All right. That was easy. That was like, you know, anything oh. related to T12s and HID, all that. Ballast like, factor. That's a good oh lighting door jo- joke. Eh? That, <laughs> it's just... You know, all the times we had to calculate things and go, oh, oh. we, we got to add that back in and all this stuff. And it's like LEDs is, yeah, I don't have to worry about. But the, all the other things that the LEDs have opened up have, mm. you know, like I couldn't do certain things before. We had what? Cool white and warm white. Yeah, <laughs> Those sure. are color options. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have such a palette of options that we can offer. I love what TCP is doing. I like what they're trying to do with um, sunlight-based uh, spectrum. I think that's that shows a shift. We're going beyond energy, you guys. Yeah. It's exciting, huh? Yeah, I'm really, ha- I'm re- you know, I'm excited about that because for years, you know, the accountants ran the business, the bean counters, mm-hmm. you know? And, and energy was one of those p- easy payback things. It's an easy thing to calculate, you know? Yeah, for so, sure. But, but 
but that's kind of the, the genesis of my firm is really looking at going beyond energy, doing retrofits and providing quality lighting to mm. my clients and to those customers. So uh, energy is is waning in the utility world. People, you know, the incentives are there, but they're 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 easier to get, but they're also harder to get in the sense we've saturated the market mm. with a lot of tubes and bulbs and things like that. Um, in the New England area, it's it's been more challenging for utilities to claim savings on lighting. And so that's diminished a lot. Um, and so now what do you do with that investment, with your lighting investment? Well, I think quality is the next place to go. And I think health is going to be a huge component to what we're doing. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's one thing that stands out about when I read your background here, and you can talk more too about it. But is your lighting designer, but you also take into account energy savings and and utility rebates and incentives. Mm -hmm. You worked for the National Grid as a commercial lighting mm -hmm. program manager. Correct. Yeah, that was um, that was fun. that was really interesting. That was a, a way to help uh, National Grid and as well as all my uh, other related utilities in the Massachusetts area and Rhode Island and. In, in New York, um, basically develop their energy efficiency programs and take into account more comprehensive um, type of projects. Um, one of the things I'm proud of is looking at uh, two things. One is looking at performance lighting and, and how you can look at the entire project, compare it to what's code. And if you could beat code by a certain amount, you could get a certain amount of money if you add controls. So really looking at encouraging better controls, encourage, encouraging better what we call right sizing the lighting for the space and not just one for one replacements, mm. a widget approach, which a lot of utilities do going beyond that. And so that, that I think was successful. Um, and folks who really embrace that, I think have gotten a lot of incentive money for their, for their customers. Um, so that, that was one thing. The other thing was also encouraging lighting designers to be more engaged in, in these projects as well. So we had a, a, a program called lighting designer incentive. So if you had a lighting in designer, they would get a sum equal to 20% of the incentive. So that really encouraged more lighting designers to be engaged and also absolved them. You guys will love this. They, they didn't have to worry about DLC if a lighting designer was involved. Wow. Nice. That, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, DLC is, is the floor, as I always refer to it. It's a wonderful floor. We all hmm. remember the Wild West, Sure. how LEDs came in, and it was crazy. We went to a trade show, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so... DLC has definitely um, harnessed and controlled that structure. I'm actually on the, uh, uh, on the uh, advisory committee for DLC, Industry Advisory Committee. And that's been great watching its growth. And they're looking at what's next as well. So and quality is definitely an aspect that they're looking at. So what, what made you, so you started as a lighting designer, you are a lighting designer, mm -hmm. but what made mm -hmm. you get into that? You had your own firm for a while, it looks like, and then mm -hmm. you got into managing <laughs> utilities. What was that? Well, it was fortuitous because my family moved to the East Coast, and um, um, we moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, to attend. My wife is attending one of the schools in that area, <laughs> and so you can't say no to that school. Let's say that way. So we had to uproot our whole family from Seattle, where I had my own firm, to uh, the Boston area, and and I, then I I got a position at National Grid. For me, it was an opportunity to bring my lighting expertise with my energy understanding and bring them all together at a utility. Um, it was one of those rare convergences of, I wasn't a utility guy, I was a lighting guy trying to inform a utility program. There needs to be Got more it. of that. You know, there needs to be <sighs> more of that, actually. Yeah. Um, because I, I think what, what I've seen, just in observing this and doing this podcast, is that a lot of the people at you. So, you know, in, in, in Ontario, each utility would have had like a lighting specialist or a, a, mm -hmm. um, uh, an LC on their staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is going back 15 years ago. That's uh, very progressive. Yeah. yeah. Not anymore. No, they got rid of them all. And now, wow. yeah, all those guys mm. are, and gals are gone. They don't work for utilities mm. anymore. Mm. And the utilities have hired consulting firms mm -hmm. and they're relying on that, that QPL from the DLC. And mm -hmm. now... The, the entire program in Ontario is simply prescriptive. And like you said, prescriptive is like the floor. It's like yeah. The, it, yeah. now you're widget based. Everything's one for one. You see yeah. a T8 tube, put in an right. LED T8 tube. That's exactly. all you got. In, in the short term, it's that immediate type of thing where they're looking at, you know, typically upfront costs, but not long range, you know, uh, life cycle costs and maintenance costs and, 
And this is basically how to improve your space through lighting. Sure. One of the, um, the key phrases I use is revitalizing the space. So you have an mm. opportunity. You have another bite of that apple. You're getting rid of all your fluorescent. How do you make that space even better? As, as Joe Biden talks about build back better, how do you build back these buildings to make them better? Because existing buildings are the majority of the building stock. We have mm. to go back and make them better. And we can't just do it by one-for-one -one replacements, replacing that fluorescent fixture, which was you know, designed in the 70s with a uh, LED tube. That doesn't even make sense when you could put in a whole new fixture that actually works better, provides better light. And we talk about the quality lighting, uh, uh, looking at spectrum. And spectrum is becoming a lot something that we can really tune into now. You know, so we can entrain circadian systems, make people healthier, make them sleep better, make them more productive, make children have better test scores. That alone would mean I would retrofit entire cities, uh, their whole school system, and make them better, not by replacing tubes, but by looking at the lighting and really doing a redesign of the lighting to make it better. You know, it's interesting with lighting. The only thing I've seen that's definitive with uh, health and students, specifically with test scores, mm -hmm. was when Adam Lillian pointed out, the, the mm -hmm. he um, he brought up that they had 200, he can, he, um, brought together 200 different unique studies. Mm -hmm, All of mm -hmm. them found that increased um, windows right. led to higher Lisa, test scores. Okay, right. So Lisa and, Heshan is the one who championed that. Fantastic. And she's, yeah, she was amazing. And, and her, her studies were challenged. So she went back and looked at it again, and she found they held true. Well, what, what and, the outlier uh, was, was that the, the, the class, so they, they were saying, well, couldn't it just be the view or whatever? Sure. And, the, and the thing was that, yes, the view's part of it, but it held for sun tunnels. Right. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like mm -hmm. the, it, did, it wasn't as high, but there was a, a statistical difference between right. classrooms with sun tunnels and yeah. classrooms yeah. with windows. So there's like, mm -hmm. you can upgrade a classroom simply by bringing in natural right. daylight into the space. Um, which is I, dynamic, which changes, absolutely. which is not static 6500, as some people have been promoting. Mm -hmm. It's actually a dynamic changing in, in sky. Um, so absolutely, that's absolutely. And, and even having a 2% increase in test scores has such an enormous difference Massive. Uh, from school system to school system. So, so and you know in productivity, if you could do anything inside a building and increase productivity by 0.1%, the profitability of your company goes up. So. Um, it has a huge impact. The people well, have how, been do we, how do we it. get the lighting design community to embrace daylighting? Because that would be that's where the massive impacts come in. It, like getting well, daylighting into existing buildings is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it, because when you deal with the envelope, it's a long payback. And I trust me, that, that was my uh, final except thing. It, I was except do if at you National factor Grid. in ten percent, fifteen percent increase in test scores. Like think well, about that. They don't though. That's the funny thing is that if you go to, if you look at some of the people who are doing retrofits for schools, all they were doing is tubes are really the bottom line easiest stuff because the school systems didn't have the capital to really take an investment looking at envelope, looking at how to make those those windows better, how to provide daylighting deeper into the into the space through light shelves and through um different films and that you can actually bring the light deeper into the space and then adding controls so that the, the lights respond to that daylight. Um, so we need to really look at those investments. I'm hoping that some of the investments that are happening uh, perhaps in, in, in the bill that just passed through Biden for COVID relief, I'm hoping that some of that also goes toward making those schools better and healthier for those students because the benefits are going to be far better. And again, we need to build back better. We, we can't go back to what we did before replacing tubes and doing the bottom, you know, bare, bo so bare limit. Where, who from the lighting industry is lobbying, lobbying the government to have lighting projects included in that? I've heard a lot about HVAC in mm -hmm. the U.S. Okay, I've heard a lot about HVAC, but, you know, especially with, you know, adding um, uh, germicidal component to HVAC systems mm -hmm. and this kind of thing as being part of that mm -hmm. bill. Who's, mm -hmm. who's fighting for the lighting industry uh, there? Do we have anyone? There are people at DOE who are incredibly smart. Uh, uh, Gabe Arnold is one of my favorite people. Sure. And there are some other people who are working for the DOE who are actually promoting those ideas. So, and they're trying to embed it into those efforts. So, um, but we also have lobbying efforts of people outside of, you know, IES can't lobby necessarily, but, but there are other people who are working with governments to try to, you know, to try to promote the lighting as a, as a remedy within schools and within government buildings and within all kinds of spaces. That's just one aspect. And think about all the school districts that are under-resourced. 
where um, uh, the kids, so you know, most of them are kids of color, don't get the resources that other school districts get simply because schools are based on the tax system, you know, and that's mm -hmm. how they're funded, right? Property taxes. How do we mean? Property taxes, exactly. Yeah. So how do we how do we improve those schools? And I think the government, the federal government, has a has a, could play a huge role in doing that in improving well, them I mean, with the lighting and too, the, the other issue too there is like. The, um, all of these schools are run by trustees. I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of the strategy here, right? Like mm -hmm. if we, if the lighting industry is going to say, we can be a remedy, we can be one of these mm -hmm. remedies. And here's the proof actually, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like there is actual right. proof. There's right? solid evidence. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's mm -hmm. the proof. And mm -hmm. I think you got to get to the trustee level. I think you got to get like they ask the 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 federal government can stroke a big check. Mm -hmm. Yes, they can mm -hmm. do that and mm -hmm. and help it. But someone has to get to these trustees, these school boards, and let them know that lighting has a proven payback on test scores and helping students. But what if we also change the business model? What if we look at lighting as a service? What if we look at getting rid of the upfront costs and we look at a long term type of investment where you, we're providing quality lighting over time? And in five years, if I think back five years ago, the efficacy of some of those LEDs, they could be replaced right now. We could still get a delta in energy, right? Mm -hmm. So five years from now, think about the improvements that are happening in LEDs that we could replace them further so that we could have replaceable modules within LED fixtures that we could improve over time, making the controls always work, improving daylighting over time so that people are, are it's a long-term investment and it's an investment, not just in the building, but in the in the kids in that building or in the occupants of that building. It's a <clears throat> that's some excuse me. Sorry, that's some blue sky thinking right there, Greg Eric. There are companies got? doing that right now, doing <laughs> yeah. it right now. They are actually are doing lighting as a service, and so yeah. They're, but they're, we we've interviewed a couple of them, and and yeah. so oftentimes what happens, I don't know about. I think that lighting as a service in the school system is probably mm -hmm. the best application for that, Greg. Mm -hmm. I know that, um, excuse me, I know that a specific amount of s some um, businesses, most people are not attracted to that in, in the commercial industrial side because I've tried it. And mm -hmm. I know that it, it's, it struggles, but I think it, in the school, I, I always like to identify an area where a business mm -hmm. model works. And mm -hmm. that's an area where I think the business model could work very well. I think I think public buildings is another place. Those are long-term investments. Those buildings aren't going anywhere. I think uh, schools and public buildings are, are good places to start. And that and that is actually kind of speaks also to an equity issue, going to those communities um, that have been marginalized. And there are a lot of public buildings there. Um, you think about multifamily housing, things like that. How do we reinvigorate those spaces with quality lighting? That's something that we can also look at. So. Uh, we've not we've we disinvested in many of those communities, and so now we need to reinvest in those communities. And so, if you were hire gonna, people from those yeah. communities, <laughs> yeah. If if you let's say you, you pick a school project you're going to work on that has you know a, a district with ten buildings or whatever, mm -hmm. and they want to do they want to do the right lighting. What mm -hmm. are the steps they should take right now? Because right now, how it is 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 what you said is they have this fixture. We're going to put that in that fixture that. You know, we right. haven't, so you, you need a design involved. Right. So you need an investment grade audit. You need to look at every fixture and all the controls and what's happening there. But that audit needs to also include, to your point, daylighting as well. So what are the daylighting opportunities? How does daylight impact that building? A lot of times skylights and, and clear stories get painted over. You know, there's, there's things that people just kind of ignore. Over time, that's happened. They were causing more problems. Well, how do we re revitalize those buildings and looking at those components. So you need to first do an audit. Second, looking at that audit, you need to then look at what are what's a good match technology-wise to those spaces and make that work. Um, making those spaces, especially classrooms, uh, become more energy efficient, looking at the, the PowerPoints. That's always a kid critical thing. We don't want to move PowerPoints. That's too expensive, too much labor. Well, you can do a lot more with LEDs. As you, you guys know, some of those buildings could ultimately be even DC um, powered so that you provide certain flexibility by moving those fixtures around where you're no longer dealing with hard conduit. So looking at the, providing the right type of lighting, which may improve or in, involve more light or more lighting fixtures, but providing, utilizing less energy, but providing better light onto the 
onto the, the students. So those type of things, that's where balancing of, of, of design comes in. I always say engineers um, solve problems, but designers find interesting problems to solve. And it's really about balancing the energy needs with the quality needs, with the health needs. All of those things in balance is what good design does. And who, in your opinion, can can realistically do a proper investment grade audit? A lot of people say they can, and they mm -hmm. call it that, and they charge for it. But who needs to be involved to do a proper investment grade audit? Well, I, I I have to embrace my the people also in in, um, in the ESCO world. I think they can step up their game and they could actually provide some in investment grade audits. And there's a couple of firms that we're lo working with locally. Actually, one firm we're working with locally who can do something like that. Um, I think partnering with lighting designers is really a, a good way to go strategically to do that. So it expands the services that you can offer. And they could provide a turnkey solution. They could provide the full package, but it's a fully well-designed package. So you've got here, lighting designers. Do you need engineers? Do you need who mm -hmm. else do you need? What other group types? You, well, A, you, you also need distributors who can, you know, sometimes you need to package these things. They're not going to be unrealistic. <laughs> you can package yeah. them, but package yeah. them with quality fixtures. Throw out the DLC. The DLC is helpful for certain things, but that's the floor. But well, look for higher quality fixtures that you can provide into those packages. So um, stop. So I'm going to give you. I want to give you an anecdote. I'm going to play. <laughs> I'm going to play uh, devil's advocate here. Okay, mm -hmm. because there's we're talking. What we're talking about is is fantastic, in a sense. But listen, lighting designers are all over the place. Okay, like mm -hmm. there are good lighting designers, and then there's some lighting mm -hmm. designers that you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say, you know, there's some lighting designers that I wonder what association they belong to, let's say. But um, <laughs> but let me give you an example. Present One, company ex exempted. Yeah. yeah, excluded, brother, of course. <laughs> well, I'm not a lighting designer. I, I, I'll i tell everyone. I'm just, I sell light bulbs every day. Um, but so the, the, let me throw this out there. One of the things that comes across our desk intermittently mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. an existing client. So somebody that's been ordering you know, material from us for years. Um, maybe they did a retrofit of their parking garage or something. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, you know, um, we're redesigning the lobby of the hotel and the lighting package is $1.7 million. Mm -hmm. um, that's like it, it, the last time we renovated the lobby, the lighting package was $90,000. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. We're wondering, uh, you know, if you could, you could have a look at this for us. Okay. So we mm -hmm. get the thing, we take a look at it and, mm -hmm. It's ridiculously specified to the point mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I understand like the Ritz Carlton or something like that or whatever, but <laughs> yeah, even the Ritz Carlton, I mean, you, I, you know, some you thinking like, what is it? Why did they spec this fixture? What is this about? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I get it. And you kind of looking at it, but this is what kind of happens sometimes with lighting designers is you get these massively over specified ridiculously complex lighting systems that perhaps a hotel with a couple maintenance people that are earning, you know, very low wages um, and are mm -hmm. overtaxed already, you know, they're already mm -hmm. very busy are not going to be mm -hmm. able to integrate and move forward with mm -hmm. um, in the long term. How do we avoid that, you know, over specification, the over complication that can come with some of this? You know, that, that again, looks at that balancing aspect as a designer you have to be cost effective and you have to specify fixtures that that are going to a a lot of times a lot of designers don't even specify fixtures that are maintainable yeah they may last 10 years but what happens after 10 years and what about improving upgrading those fixtures things like that so you got to put that early in the contract saying these this has to be cost effective um, you can set a, a dollar per square foot type of limit you can, there are certain ways you can do that but you, you have to hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they're adhering to that. And involve the utilities, because they will give you money for doing good design. So make sure they're engaged in this and get some incentive money. Now, you distributors, sometimes you work with utilities, sometimes you don't. The easiest thing for you to do is what we call the midstream, where they don't even see the utility rebate, right? You guys just have it from the back end. And the utilities give you money, and you guys put out those tubes and do your thing. And that's that's been great. That's been gold. You've been making a lot of money on that. But now, for those larger specif specified packages, 
you also need to be engaged in getting incentives for that and helping those customers get those incentives. Designers, a lot of times, don't even know how to navigate that. They have no idea. That's something that doesn't even show up on their, their radar to get incentives. So you probably will have to hold their hand in that. Oh, you're right. So that, that's one of the things you, you touched on there. But a lot of design work I've seen doesn't really take into account long-term maintenance of the fixture. Is that something that... Mm -hmm. How, how do you how do you do that? How do you because you don't know if the company is going to be around in five years? It's just like how do we sell it? Before you answer Mike's the question, someone, before before you answer the question, Edward, I just want to throw something in here because we've talked about this before, uh -huh. where we've increased the life of the light source while reducing right. the life cycle of the light fixture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That that's yeah. Right. I don't think that's environmentally responsible. I don't think that's uh, financially responsible. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of that comes into the palette of a lighting designer. I can do whatever I want. And <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not thinking about what happens right. when that array of LEDs goes out. Oh, it's, but it's beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, I, I absolutely. Certain designers do not think of that. It is incumbent upon designers to think of that. I think the maintainability, that's what we had to do with fluorescence, right? We had to figure out how these fixtures are maintained. Uh, every down light had to, you know, figure out if you could get a child's hand up there to change the bulb, things like that. Uh, now we could kind of ignore that. It's manufacturers hopefully have responded by making these fixtures easier to maintain and change the modules. Uh, DLC is looking at, a, you know, what does that look like? Um, there's a whole range of folks. Look at the Zaga Consortium and those folks, you know, they're looking at how to embed controls and all those type of things into these fixtures. So, we're still, I know it's hard to believe it, we're still at the beginning stages of LEDs. I, I still agree. think they have a lot more yep. maturing to happen in order for those issues to be addressed fully with confidence for the customer. I couldn't agree with you more. I actually think you're right. And, and I want to, if I, Greg, can I, can I segue into something else here? Yeah. So I think the, the, the um, something I'm very passionate about, and I, and I know you are as well, I know you know Jane Slade. Um, she has mentioned you a mm -hmm. couple times. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And so we had She's a neighbor. Start oh, she, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Massachusetts, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had and discussed star yeah. yeah. Starving for Darkness is a, is a new show that we've created and and uh, I'm hoping you'll be a guest on that show as well. But just to address it, it here, the um the idea, the number one area that I think is is addressable that we there's no it's not blue sky thinking that we have all the knowledge mm -hmm. we need now. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is the largest source of revenue to the lighting industry that's not being addressed is the dark sky issue and the outdoor light fixtures. Mm -hmm. How do we get the utilities to recognize that light pollution is pollution? How do we get them to recognize that? It's tough. It's, um, you know, I, you would hope that you would train up the utility folks, especially the street lighting folks, to understand that. They typically respond to the squeaky wheel, the, the complaining neighborhood. So they throw up floodlights and they, they do all these bad ideas that um, light trespass and they throw in many streetlights. Um, they also get the lowest bidder for doing a lot of streetlight projects. So they throw in unshielded streetlights everywhere. They look at kind of uniformity. They look at the wrong metrics for doing streetlights. So you, I think it's incumbent upon the IES the, the, and, and this is really important. The utilities need to utilize the standards that exist. They're really good standards. They've been proven by science. You know, you got people in, in, in you know, in Virginia who are doing some amazing studies on well, the, mo the model lighting, lighting order. The lighting. Model, model lighting ordinance has been out for fifteen years. Brilliant, absolutely. Or people whatever, need to pay attention years. to that and, and yeah. utilize that, and, and actually make sure that it is it is applied absolutely. So, utility folks, they have the tools. They just need to pay attention to those tools. And, and communities need to also pay attention. They need to kind of, as many dark sky communities are doing now, they're actually put that into your, your policies, put that into the, into the, when you do the bidding process, make sure that that stuff is embedded into that process. So I think that's what makes it happen. At the risk of going back into some of the issues we discussed in the first podcast, um, I think that there's a, <laughs> I think that there's a, a tendency to over light for safety, which has the opposite effect. <laughs> and it, this is uh, particular. This? What? Let's well, go. I well no. Well, let, I let think, me tell you. I think you're I, absolutely without, right. You're, I, I think that I would you say, light up something like a prison yard. It feels like a prison yard, and people behave a certain way. 
So, so me and my good colleague, Mark Loeffler, are giving a talk at Light Fair called Light Plus Justice. And we've been giving parts of that talk um, recently. Um, it does talk about how a lot of, if you, to your point, if you, light, if you light up a prison, light up a space like a prison yard, people will act like prisoners. Or, or in, in, um, you also make those areas become suspect. You know, people feel like they're always being watched. So the surveillance lighting in, in, is really about that. So, and this goes back historically. If you look at redlining within communities and how um, blacks were not allowed to actually get loans for buying houses in those communities because they were redlined. Um, that ended in the 60s, but it started in the 30s. So a lot of that, think about the wealth that they had. So they're kind of, you know, those areas are actually overlit in many ways too. A recent study showed that those areas are overlit. There's too much light in those areas. And a lot of that and light I actually, I actually is, to, is for surveillance and for, quote unquote, security, but it's for policing and for surveillance yes. and not for making people comfortable, safe, and secure, and, and, you know, and, and their health as well. I actually think that it reduces safety. And I'm gonna, I want to throw a theory at you here, which came up on Starving for Darkness, um, or one of the shows I did with Jane. And we were talking about street lighting. And I brought up the point that, you know, over the past summer, we've seen a lot of protests that as mm -hmm. the night came, turned into the, there was an increase in violence. And then mm -hmm. I actually believe, okay, that it, mm -hmm. it, if you were to slowly dim those lights, okay, if you were to mm -hmm. say like at, at, at about 10 o'clock or nine o'clock, if you were to slowly lower mm -hmm. the Kelvin temperature, really low, mm -hmm. and alternatively mm -hmm. dim the lights, you would reduce mm -hmm. The um, people would feel like it's time to go home. It's called queuing. So it's okay. The queuing, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it's time to go home now. And one mm -hmm. of the problems you see, you know, if you watch some of the videos, you, it doesn't seem like it's nighttime in the video. Like you can mm -hmm. see clearly mm -hmm. from one end of the street to the other end mm -hmm. of the street the mayhem mm -hmm. that's going on with police and and people on the streets and all this sort of stuff. And I don't think that would happen if the street lights weren't so uniformly bright all the way across the street. And I, I actually so, believe so, it's increasing those problems. Mm -hmm. So there was a study recently looking at crime and lighting, and it was done, uh, I think, mostly in New York, but it was a you know, pretty substantial study. In New York, they did a thing called omnipresence. And what they did is they put up these high mask lights with generators in like, quote unquote, high crime areas. And they had police in those areas. And sure enough, um, the crime rate went down. So, so they thought lighting reduces crime. Well, it turns out nobody went in those areas. All those areas looked like crime scenes. Yes. So they were really hostile. So um, to your point, uh, more light does not necessarily reduce crime. Temporarily, it may have a bump, but overall, those things will not last. Better lighting and lighting that does reduce, like I live in Cambridge, and our lights actually go to half I think at 10 o'clock, I never notice it. And I'm sure, a lighting yes, guy. I would yes. notice something like this. <laughs> yeah. um, we have not had an increase in crime since those lights have been put in. Nothing like that has happened at all. So a reduction that's been really subtle and has changed. Now, I like your idea of the color temperature shifting. I think that actually does, um, I think that type of queuing could be really helpful for people. And absolutely, we have the technology to do that. But think about it. If you do add more chips to those fixtures, uh, their overall efficacy will go down, right? But if you're using it over time, it will be actually a pretty much null. Um, it wouldn't really increase energy use because you're shifting from one set of LEDs to another set of LEDs toward the warmth. And I think that type of way of measuring a fixture's efficacy is the way that we need to go and not just the overall type of looking at the total consumption of a fixture and the total consumption of a lighting system. So I, I like your idea a lot. I think I mean, and controls like, and LEDs with, with allow you to, to do that. With lighting controls, okay. Yeah. It's kind of confusing, you know, the payback and how to utilize them within the interior space and whether or not it's going to mm -hmm. work good. And there's so many different applications. There is no confusion with outdoor lighting. Right. Okay. Outdoor, absolutely. It, it's mm -hmm. so obvious. Like, okay, you actually have an emergency in the area. Okay. Turn the lights to 5,000 Kelvin and right. increase their brightness. Mm -hmm. they, 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 mm -hmm. Maybe the 911 call operators can do this at a certain address or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they dim or they're uncontrolled. It's so mm -hmm. obviously a, a beautiful mm -hmm. application for lighting controls. And why, why it's not 
like it doesn't seem to be pursued by anyone. It, the, it's almost like the lighting industry is like, oh, I, I didn't cause that light trespass. It wasn't my pictures that did that. It's not my, I don't want to, I don't want to get involved. This is the biggest, single, easiest open opportunity this industry has. We should swing from the trees with a knife in our teeth towards it. Well, I think, I hate to say this, unfortunately, I think in Europe, um, you'll see a lot of these innovative ideas being applied. In America, people are so uh, litigious and mm -hmm. um, liability is such a bigger problem here in America that they don't take risk and try these type of ideas out. Their evidence, the scientific evidence is absolutely there. There's no doubt about that. We just need both a manufacturer and a city to embrace those ideas. Uh, when I was at National Grid, I had the luxury of actually putting on pilots and pilots where we could try at certain things, maybe non-energy related type of efforts for communities and for different efforts. And I think uh, there's a lot of, there's a pool of money there for utilities to do that, for governments to try something like this. The money is there. It's just the willpower of doing something like this. I, I agree with you. Um, partnering with a university is probably one of the better things to do because they can monitor those type of things and look for the results. Hmm. So the it's I I I just I'm so encouraging towards this the industry all parties from the IES down to nailed at the mm -hmm. bottom in the trenches to the lighting designers and engineers this is not mm -hmm. a problem for us this is the single greatest opportunity we have to all get rich Edward Bartholomew like, I'm not kidding you <laughs> it's a win it's a win 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 and, win win again I say put those investments in under invested communities marginalized communities start there. Because th they will not only appreciate those things, but we could really kind of remedy what we've been ignoring for so long. So those communities can actually have quality lighting um, and, and this better quality of, of life in, in those communities through light. The, so as, as you guys are talking through all this, you know, the thing that keeps hitting me is that we, we, we almost need to go. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we almost need to go and change everything that we've done is what, is what it sounds like to me. And to do that is cost money, right? And and I heard mm -hmm. a government interaction. Is there any mm -hmm. other way to do this? Do we need the government to do this for us? <laughs> is that it? Well, let's put it this way. Energy is is no longer going to be the driver that it used to be as far as you know your return on investment type of thing. So you need to find another mechanism to get your return on investment. So quality and health are probably the next bigger drivers that are going to happen. So we need to... And with LEDs, we actually can in, in, in enable that, right? So we need to move, we need to shift toward that now. We need to create uh, financial models and business models that can shift toward that. Um, and, and, and the government is going to help. The government always pushes money or pushes these ideas forward. They're the ones who will do those pilots and things like that. So, you know, we had big ideas in the New Deal after World War II. We tried some new things out. Um, and in the 60s, we had a huge, you know, infusion of federal government doing things there. We're at that point now, we're at that inflection point in the 2020s. We need to invest in bold new ideas and to create these changes based on science, based on evidence. We can do these things. And the government, unfortunately, has the deepest pockets. So they're probably going to lead. Is, so with that in mind, is this the best time to be a lighting designer? I think lighting. so. I really, I think so. There's so much to learn. Um, let me give you guys a uh, a scoop, and uh, I haven't been authorized to do this, but um, I've been working with Morgan State, um, a historically black college um, in Maryland, in uh, in Baltimore, and we just got approved for a Knuckles Fund, thirty thousand um, dollars, and so we're really excited about that because. What that does is it brings in more lighting designers. We want to bring in more qualified lighting designers. And we want to also address the pipeline issue of bringing lighting designers of color into our community. So it's a twofer type of thing. And so I'm, I'm happy to know that the industry is making an effort. And I'm glad to be a part of that effort. I'll be co-teaching a class in the graduate department um, with my, my good friend Greg. And, uh, and uh, we'll be teaching a new generation of lighting designers. We need more investments like that. We need, this is a perfect time for being a lighting designer. Or a distributor, folks. If you made it to the Absolutely. end. Absolutely. Yeah, if you made it to the <laughs> end, this is a very, there are so many different careers in the lighting business which are dynamic and wonderful. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's one of those industries where the bulk of your knowledge is going to come from working in the industry. And, you know, there's a certain amount of, there's not a lot of schooling that's involved in, in becoming a, working for a lighting distributor or becoming a lighting designer. You're going to learn it by practicing. And that's, what's wonderful about it is that you learn and, and get paid And you never stop learn. learning. Yeah. I, I, sure. I am, I am taking webinars all the time and mm -hmm. having my mind blown. Like I did not even think about that, sure. you know, have you guys had that experience lately? It's like, sure. oh yeah, there are some brilliant people out there. And so I had Mark Ray blow cool my mind. I had Mark Ray oh, blow Mark. my mind. Mark is brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, we, he, he did some courses for LS Evolve for us, mm -hmm. and they're three to nine minutes long. Okay. And each mm -hmm. one, my, I was like, <laughs> like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, and, like, I'm just taking what he's saying, and I know exactly right. what to do now and sell it in the field right. and help people. You know, long term care centers and all this kind of stuff he was talking about. But you have to be right. a nailed member to take LS Evolve. I'm not going to tell you what it's all about. <laughs> but Mark Ray's there. You see, you got, you got to open that up. See, for other folks to yeah. come in and take those things. Well, they, anyone can be a member. It's only 50 bucks. So anyone <laughs> oh, can be an individual member of Nailed. But folks, Perfect. you made it to the end. Uh, say goodbye to the listeners, Edward. Goodbye, listeners. And it's been a pleasure, <laughs> uh, both Mike and Greg. Thank Thanks you. for listening. And of course, if you've made it this far, the first thing you're going to do right now is pull out that smartphone, that computer. You're going to put tcpi.com in the browser, Greg. Woo! Check out their Solistic product, the most natural sunlight light bulb in the market. They have an LED tube. They have a star light and screw in light bulb, a table lamp, a floor lamp, and high CRI, high R9 value, all the good stuff you need out of it. It is something unique that not a lot of other manufacturers have, so check that out. And, of course, pr proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, NAILD.org. And, of course, thank you to Edward Bartholomew, our friend who's joined us again, very generous with his time. And uh, we have links to all his stuff on our website on the Get a Grip on Lighting.com website for you if you made it to the end. I love you. Take care. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.